right. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Adventures in DevOps. Uh, we are, when we record this, uh, a lot of us are still quarantined or having to stay at home. So we're hoping by the time you listen to this, uh, that will have eased up a little bit. But we are glad to be here today coming to you from our homes. Uh, as always, I'm Nell Shamrell Harrington. I'm an engineer at Mozilla and one of your hosts. And with me is my co-host, or two of my co-hosts, the first of which is Tyler Bird. Tyler, how are you doing today? Great, thanks for asking. Um, yeah, I work for Cengage, and I'm a senior uh, DevOps engineer there. And I actually just started about a month ago, so. It's still new going, but we primarily work on, I work in the platform team and we are going through a big transition right now. So even though all this stuff's going on in the, in the world, a lot of people are moving, uh, moving all their apps. So it's keeping us all busy. So it is actually kind of nice to have a lot of, a lot of work, even though it's a little bit shorey, you know, to get done, it's good to get done. So I'm, I'm busy in the middle of all that these days. Cool. And with us also is uh, Chuck. Chuck, how are you doing? I'm staying busy. Um, a lot of people are looking for stuff to current on or work on or work with um, while they're stuck at home. And so I've been working on organizing uh, remote conferences. Um, I really do want to do a DevOps one. It's just a matter of figuring out when to do it and uh, stuff like that. But yeah, I've been doing um, remote meetups actually for uh, some of our bigger communities on devchat.tv. So that's JavaScript, React, uh, Angular View, and Ruby. And yeah, hopefully we can get some more stuff going. This episode is sponsored by Gravitational. As your team and cloud infrastructure grows, you may want to reevaluate how you access SSH servers and Kubernetes clusters. Gravitational Teleport is an emerging open source replacement for OpenSSH, which was built for modern cloud workloads. Teleport is opinionated. It does not allow SSH keys, and instead it insists on certificate-based authentication, making it dead easy to set up and use. Teleport is fully compatible with your SSH and Kubernetes tooling, comes with a beautiful web UI and an audit log, and it allows users to access servers outside of data centers like IoT devices. It was called Teleport because it creates the illusion that all your company's servers are in the same room with you, even if some of them are self-driving vehicles. Download Teleport on gravitational.com slash teleport or find it on github.com slash gravitational slash teleport. Fantastic. Looking forward to seeing the, uh, seeing the announcements for those. And we have our guest today. We have Ev Consavoy. Is that how you say your last name? Yeah, that's, uh, that's right. Consavoy. Oh, wow. Uh, I'm impressed I got that right. Who is a co-founder at Gravitational. Uh, Ev, tell us a little bit about yourself. About myself, um, sure. People usually like talking about themselves. So um, I'm an engineer by training. Always knew I wanted to be an engineer ever since, ever since I was a uh, uh, little. I uh, grew up in family of engineers. Uh, moved to the state to United States from uh, Russia when I was 21 years old. So um, just in time to uh, to be able to uh, visit the bar. So that was convenient. And uh, I work at a company called National Instruments. It was my first uh, employer where I uh, basically learned that making uh, instruments, making tools for other engineers is the, uh, is the best job you could have uh, simply because making tools for people who are just like you. Um, and that's what I've been doing most of my career. And that's what Gravitational is about as well. So um, we build solutions to make other engineers more productive. Cool. Well, we are glad to have you here. And I really like the topic of the show, or at least the topic we're going to start off with, which is it's one of the very first things I think you learn as a system and, and as a developer once you get to the point where you're not just developing on your local machine. And that is SSHing or, uh, you know, connecting to other computers. And I loved the title that was suggested for this episode, which was, I know what you did last session. So, Ev, I know that one of the things your company is focusing on is improving the SSH experience. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this, you know, the, the former state of SSH, uh, what it's going to, and what, what you're trying to bring it to? Absolutely. So, uh, first of all, I would make a, a reasonable comment that there is no well-defined state of SSH. Instead, you have a uh, collection of companies out there, like soup of different pro processes that people are using. 
So some organizations are more sophisticated simply because they can afford to have um, uh, qualified security people, qualified DevOps people, uh, but not everyone is that lucky. So if you if if you work at Google, Netflix, Amazon, um, uh, they, any of those companies, you've always had a fantastic uh, story around accessing your infrastructure using SSH or by any other means. Simply because these companies are sophisticated, they understand security. They also operating in this. They also operate in the future. Like the technology that uh, these top businesses use today is what uh, the rest of the world will be using like five years from now. So, but then there are uh, companies, let's call them like the rest of us or the rest of the world. Um, I don't want to like point fingers, but you have airlines, you have retail, you have banking, you have all kinds of businesses uh, who have servers, who have cloud infrastructure. And they also have exact same needs. Everyone actually wants to be secure. Everyone want, uh, wants to push code to production. And uh, if you look at the rest of the world, what was happening there, and I saw it myself because because I spent several years at Rackspace, um, a second uh, largest cloud provider at the time. And I got to see a lot of uh, Rackspace customers, uh, smaller companies, mid-sized companies, they've always been struggling with it. And if you look into their uh, the state of their kind of server access or privileged access, um, you, you would see, um, so their, the state of their SSH was all over the map. Uh, some would basically expose every server to the internet and they would have, let's say, like a predefined user like admin, and they would have uh, the, the SSH key for that admin uh, stored in a, in a special place that they supposed to um, get someone's permission to get the key out. Some people didn't really care, and for every server, they would basically have a private key, I'm sorry, a public portion of every engineer's key would be provisioned on every server, which was a complete nightmare. Um, and some people would just, like, they would say, oh, we have this one person. So only that person can do SSH stuff. Um, and some companies would just say, Look, you know what, we don't allow our engineers to touch infrastructure via SSH. In that case, when they have a, like a specific server that like constantly be pegging CPU at 100%, like they would not be able to debug and see what's going on. Um, so that was kind of the state, it was all over the map. And on one hand, you had companies, again, who figured this out, and they would build their own homegrown SSH solutions, sometimes from scratch, sometimes built around pre-existing open SSH infrastructure. And then you have companies who basically wild, wild west. Yeah, so that, that, that was sad. And what's interesting too, is that it's probably the easiest vector of attack. It's the most critical, but at the same time, look, if, you're, if you work at a company and I'm a criminal, I really, I really want to get access to your data. It's probably just cheaper for me to hire someone to steal a laptop of your uh, super privileged engineer, uh, break into that machine, get the SSH key out of it, and then get access to all of your infrastructure across all of cloud providers, including your basement and all of your data across all applications. And it's Sounds just like, like a possession scenario. of a single file gives you these superpowers. That's just insane. So on one hand, on application level, security is so great, but infrastructure security is so simplistic. So that's, I think, what the world uh, still looks like today, mostly, I think. I Boy, saw... that just got real. Yeah. <laughs> I hadn't well, thought about, oh, go steal a machine that has the SSH key on it and then access the world. Yeah, and, and the, I resemble that comment. Uh, I worked for a company about 12 years ago and was just starting to learn how SSH worked and really digging into it other than having made connections before I generated that key. And then I, I carried that key around with me for like eight years. Um, it was kind of more sentimental more than anything. <laughs> it's like I'd start a new job and I'd be like, Hey, use this one. Um, and so not only would the blast radius have been at that old job, but it could have also been multiple places depending on how well they are monitoring, you know, cleaning up old things and all that kind of stuff. So it's, I've definitely learned the error of my ways. And, and I use like a, a password manager now, you know, to manage my passwords. But uh, it just occurred to me, it's like, you know, what it, is that, is that what's something that uh, teleports and gravitational are trying to do with regard to giving developers tools to, to manage these SSH keys and make it convenient. You know, uh, we make things more convenient for people and they'll do the right thing if it's more convenient. Absolutely. I think, um, generally speaking, if you 
want your organization to have world-class SSH access uh, policy. You already have everything you need, and it, it all comes with your favorite Linux distro. There are all kinds of tools in there. They all have uh, documentation. You could create configuration files. You could set things up properly. I would even argue it's not that hard, to be honest with you. But people don't have time. People have other things to do. Sometimes they have just shortage of people on the team to, to go and own that. So, and uh, generally, I think what good progress looks like with, with, er with any technology is when you use something that does the right thing by default, right? So like when you turn on your TV, you automatically get color picture. You don't have to fill the, like you don't have to pick a codec that your TV has to use to decode signal that's coming from a um, cable provider. It's just, it just works. And that's basically what Teleport does for securely accessing your infrastructure. So if you were to go and design uh, SSH access for your team and for your application, for your company, and it doesn't have to be SSH, I would just say infrastructure access because Kubernetes falls into that same category and Teleport supports Kubernetes as well and more protocol supports are coming. So you would have to ask yourself, all right, so do I have to expose every machine to the internet? If not, okay, so I need to pick certain hosts to be visible and others are not going to be visible. So then uh, am I, like what uh, kind of conveniences or inconveniences am I introducing for my team by hiding certain services behind like VPC or whatever? So you should be like, go, like you, you're asking yourself these questions and then, okay, so what uh, hashing function should I use? What kind of ciphers should be approved for, let's say for SSH access? And then, okay, what kind of authentication methods am I going to use? Should I disable uh, root access? And so all these different settings, if you type man and nsshd.conf, you have to have an answer for these things. And the default's actually not great with most Linux distros. They're just defaults. Uh, because it's, um, again, um, I know a little bit what it takes to maintain a Linux distro. So uh, maintaining the default state of every config file of every daemon is actually a lot of work. Or you could just use a tool that without any configuration whatsoever, it will give you sensible defaults. And it will basically say, look, this is how top companies in Silicon Valley are doing it. And you get the exact same experience without even having to read documentation. Maybe we're not quite there yet, but yeah. that's the goal and design goal of Teleport to give you convenient and sensible defaults, by, uh, uh, defaults with zero effort. Mm -hmm. And some of these defaults are actually quite critical. For example, it's, I think most of us already know that using passwords for SSH access is just a bad idea, a terrible idea, especially if you have root access enabled. But Teleport extends it further and it says using SSH keys is also a terrible idea. Because what is an SSH key? It's actually extremely long password written into a file. That's all it is. Uh, so fundamentally, it's no better than having a password. And instead, Teleport says, like, certificate-based authentication, which is what the rest of the world uses. That's what your, that's like HTTPS and TLS or TLS over HTTP. That security is almost always done with certificates. That's what modern systems like Kubernetes use. And SSH supports certificates as well. It's just configuring them. It's a pain. Is, uh, is a pain, yeah. So Teleport says certificate is the only method of authentication you will have. And uh, it's going to be easy to do by default. And then Teleport also says you, you are supposed to be using Bastion hosts, but you're not supposed to get direct SSH access to them. So Teleport makes a distinction between Bastion and SSH proxy. And why is that? Well, that's because it's something that I've seen in production when people start using Bastion hosts, which means that you can SSH into Bastion host and have a session on that Bastion host. And what that does, it creates all kinds of weird incentives. We thought we were being really secure at companies where I've done that in the past. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then you start seeing your engineers start deploying things into Bastion host because it's just convenient. Oh, I need WordPress. I'm going to put it on this Bastion host, the same machine we have like SSH running on because it's already exposed to the internet. It's just kind of easy for me to do. And then you end up with a bunch of software on that machine. And that software itself has vulnerabilities. And then someone gets into a Bastion host through WordPress or through something else. Like I don't want to bash any software, but all software comes with bugs. So for that reason, Teleport says no. When you have a host like that, you're not supposed to get access to it. 
and uh, and that's what SSH proxy is. So in a, so when you um, putting teleport on your infrastructure, so you have to pick which host is going to be a proxy host, and that's the host that all other hosts automatically get connections through. But then if you have a host like that and you're trying to get access to a specific machine, you usually have to do this weird dance with open SSH. You need to tell it like, oh, like this is like the proxy is supposed to be using when you're accessing host names with certain with you when you're accessing hosts with certain names, which is also inconvenient. So teleport just kind of puts all of this away and it allows you to say SSH and then the address of the machine. And teleport will figure out that there, yeah, there is a a proxy server somewhere. It, it, so it becomes completely transparent. That's actually where the name teleport is coming from because it creates this illusion that all of your company servers are teleported to the same network with you, same room. With it you. makes me think of the Star Trek teleporter, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I like that. It's, it's, it's an inspirational name, but it also always kind of communicates all these magic properties that you get if you're using a system like this. So that's basically the goal of teleport, just to give you absolute transparent SSH that uses certificates behind the hood, under the hood, not behind the hood, behind the closed door, I guess. Uh, and uh, so those certificates are tied to your identity. So if you type SSH and the name of a machine that is supposedly sitting in your Amazon account or IP of that machine, whatever. So you, the teleport will take you through single sign-on. So you will go through, if you're using GitHub or Google or Okta or all, anything. So you'll go authenticate with your second factor, with everything, and then, um, a SSH certificate will be issued and transparently and visibly to you will be stored in your command line environment, let's say for a day, if that's the default setting. And now you can access um, uh, the, the, the infrastructure that your company uh, allows you to have access to. So that's kind of a high level how Teleport operates and uh, simplicity and industry best practices, that's really the magic formula because you want to have both. Um, yeah, I'll just kind of stop there to see if uh, if that's clear or if you, if you want to dive somewhere deeper? Um, yeah, I actually have a question about it. So I think that that makes a lot of sense that we use tele we would use teleport to uh, have a convenient way for best practices, right? So that, uh, and, and have something that just works so that you can turn it on and off and that, that's good. But the, I've always had the belief that uh, simplicity in the front end comes of complexity in the, in the back end, right? Oh, absolutely, yep. Without going into any sort of details that would enable some, you know, potential red team type of scenario to give you uh, to get access to your thing, what do you guys do architecturally to secure the information? Like I was envisioning, I'm, I'm managing a hundred boxes on AWS, and I I want to be able to SSH into all of them, but I also want only me to be able to SSH into the prod ones, but. The, there's got to be some sort of database or place you're storing the information. How are you securing the things inside of uh, inside of Teleport in a generic, you know, abstract way? Uh, sure. So we are. So in the early days, we kind of adopted this policy that we wanted to use open standards for everything possible for a variety of reasons. First of all, again. Like we're engineers ourselves and we absolutely hate this kind of weird proprietary technology that uses like different language for everything that has like a word that doesn't really mean anything outside of this ecosystem. So for that reason, like teleport command line uh, uh, CLI client is just type SSH and all the same flags are supported. So we're not really introducing any additional complexity. Uh, there is really not, not much else to learn. So if you want to change the port that you want to connect to, it's the same dash P flag and so like all the CLI stuff, it's, it is exactly the same. But if you look at the server, you're, you're right because Teleport makes all these wonderful defaults work for you magically or semi-magically. So there's gotta be something under the hood that makes it possible. And I will gradually walk towards that starting from the client. So on the client side, you get exact same CLI client. In, in fact, you can use open SSH, SSH command uh, to uh, work with teleport infrastructure as well. Um, so then once you get, once your request hits the proxy, the proxy itself is actually an extremely dumb piece of software. Are you stuck at home climbing the walls when you should be hanging out with the community at the latest conference to get canceled? Are you wondering where to hear your JavaScript heroes like Amy Knight and Douglas Crockford and Chris Heilman? After the cancellations, I decided to put on a JavaScript conference for you online. 
I invited my favorite folks from around the web and got them to come speak at an online event just for you. Go to jsremoteconf.com and check out our speakers and schedule. The conference is on May 14th and 15th. The call for proposals is open until March 31st. Come join us at an online conference that we guarantee will keep you safe and keep you informed. jsremoteconf.com because proxy doesn't really allow you to do anything. It simply connects one socket with another. So it connects two different uh, networks together. Proxy is completely stateless, stupid thing. It has a tiny, tiny, tiny config file. And that config file is basically just telling it, hey, you were running on this host name and you're supposed to use this TLS certificate if you want to serve a web user interface to let users SSH using a browser. So that's basically the only piece of configuration you need to provide. But otherwise, it just simply connects you to the machine that's actually running the daemon that you connected to or you're connecting to. So in other words, even if, some, if an attacker hacks into your data center or into Amazon data center and physically steals the machine that is running your teleport proxy, your front end to your infrastructure, and they will open up and look into the hard drive they're not going to find anything there. There are no certificates, no keys, no nothing. So again, the proxy is extremely, extremely simple piece of software. And you can go take a look at it. It's all open source. It's all on GitHub. And then finally, we get to, uh, to the actual daemon that's running a SSH service. And if you look into that little thing, it's also actually extremely simple because it doesn't support all of these different options and things that, let's say, open SSH server is supposed to do. It doesn't support key-based authentication. It doesn't support passwords. Like there is no user database. It simply looks at the certificate that you're presenting or your SSH client is presenting certificate to. And what that machine does, it basically compares if your certificate is signed by the same certificate that the machine certificate that it's running on is signed by. Does it make sense? Because in the, in the teleport world, everything revolves around the certificate authority. So which means that a host is also, it also has an identity, which means that host also has a certificate and that certificate is signed by someone. So when you're coming in and say, hey, I'm, uh, I'm Tyler and, and here's my certificate, it simply looks like, oh, it's signed by the same CA that I am signed with and it's not uh, expired. So yeah, you should be able to access me. Again, I'm simplifying, but there's role-based access control that kind of comes into play. So um, the reason I'm telling you this is because the server itself is also extremely simplific, is simplistic. Now, all of that complexity that you're correctly referring to, it does exist, and it exists in the th third component of a teleport system. This is what we call the auth server. Teleport auth server is basically a CA. That's your certificate authority. That is uh, the, the, the central authority that issues certificates. And it also keeps all the rules about your system somewhere. And yes, that thing needs a database. And when we looked into what kind of storage we would require for certificate authority, we tried to make things as simple as possible. So let's say you are a small organization with like a dozen servers in the basement or a tiny Amazon account or whatever. Um, and you don't want to use any complicated databases. <clears throat> Just use a file system. So if you have a file system that is encrypted that you can trust, uh, that is um, uh, backed up reasonably uh, frequently, just use that. So Teleport will just use flat files to store the state of your kind of uh, infrastructure. Um, but if you're running in uh, AWS, yeah, you could create a DynamoDB instance and you can point Teleport, hey, store all the secrets in Dynamo. And then you lock down Dynamo and you say no, no one has access to it enable encryption on Dynamo. Dynamo is already highly available. <clears throat> so that is uh, going to be your story. And the type of information that Teleport Auth Server would store in that database basically falls in two categories. One is secrets. So if you're a certificate authority, it basically means you are the never disappearing omnipresent private key for the organization. Because that's what CA is at the end of the day. And that's where Teleport stores that secret. So it would go in either into an encrypted file system if, we have, if you have it, or it will go into DynamoDB. Teleport also supports other backends. And it also has an API for building plugins. So if you have some additional facilities to store secrets, maybe HashiCorp Vault, you could build your own plugin that will store it. And, and like, it's up to you, basically, where you want 
teleport to store the, uh, this DCA basically. And the, say, and the second type of information that teleport stores is your audit. Uh, going back to the I was going to ask this, about yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. So, so every time when you, or maybe it, it's your CI CD pipeline, the robot of some kind is doing anything with your infrastructure, teleport keeps track of everything. Every time there is connection made, every time uh, someone types something on a keyboard, and in the uh, latest versions, we added support for um, basically system events. Every time there is a socket opened or a file is created, any change in the file system. So all of these events across all of your servers, Teleport aggregates them uh, and stores in the same database. So that's the second type of data that Teleport would store. So I wouldn't call Auth Server to be a complex piece of software from operational perspective. It was built to be maintenance free. Like we really, really want it to be maintenance free, which comes from my belief that I just ultimately, I come from engineering DevOps background and I ultimately don't want to do DevOps. I want my software just to run without my help. <laughs> so I try to make teleport as close as possible to this goal. So at the end of the day, it's a single binary. You put it on this machine somewhere, obviously turn off SSH access, turn off all access to that machine because that machine kind of hold the keys to your kingdom. That's where your certificate authority runs. So put teleport auth server in there and just let it do its job. It's not gonna fail. It's, uh, we put a lot of effort, a lot of effort to make sure that it's this kind of undestructible piece of software that doesn't really need active and ongoing management. So a question around uh, the, you know, being able, the audit, audit, uh, system being able to see what people ran. Uh, so uh, several years ago, I was working for a company that shall remain nameless, where we had a technical executive do some very, very, very bad things, uh, and uh, trying to go back forensically and figure out what this person did was extremely difficult. So if someone is using uh, teleport, using audit, uh, would they be able to identify what commands were run by whom? Uh, yes. And when, if you look at this information, you will actually realize there are multiple approaches that you could take to your audit data. On one hand, it is convenient sometimes to simply see what a person has done. Just uh, having a video-like capability where you can hit play and then pause, rewind, see exactly what was going on. It's almost like a system in body cam. <laughs> yeah, but at the same time, you realize it's not scalable. So if sure. you have a giant organization with thousands of people and uh, it's unclear who did what, you're not going to sit and watch uh, through hundreds and thousands of videos. So then there is this need to create um, a structured log information with well-documented format where you can run a query. You can ask a question. It's like, hey, tell me what happened to this host uh, through this time interval and who did that. And if you start looking at this uh, uh, problem, then you realize that it's actually a completely separate product. Uh, and there are companies that build this product, like Splunk is one example. So when you want to collect structured logs across the organization, you probably want to have a single source of truth that collects everything that happened um, everywhere. And you realize that SSH is not the only source of audit information because people use other methods and there are other pieces of software that produce these logs. So that's basically why you have products like Splunk or maybe Elasticsearch. So what you would do in the case of Teleport, you would configure it to generate structured log information, audit information, and send this to one of these uh, uh, facilities. So then you could basically, uh, using automation, you could uh, run queries and identify what uh, interesting events happened on a partition of your infrastructure in a certain period of time. And then you can filter out by person. Because the nice thing about uh, using certificates too is that certificates are tied to your identity. So in a traditional SSH world, you would see like a username and IP. I could say like admin from this IP address, which usually doesn't mean anything, did something. But who is behind that admin uh, alias? But if you're using a certificates and they're tied to your identity, you will see an email address and the full name of the person. So, which is um, why we believe that certificates should be the only allowed method to authenticate anything, really, not just people, but also um, automation. Yeah, that's cool. I, I liked what you said about uh, this, the auth server being 
you know, virtually maintenance free, but it made me start to think about, so where do you feel like your vulnerability challenges are going forward on, on teleport? Is it basically trying to stay uh, up to date with, with how CAs work and, and the, and that type of information, if there's like a CVE that has something to do with those, then, then you'll, they'll, you know, write a patch or, or something to that effect. That's a great question. Um, I guess it's opportunity for me to come clean, right? If there are any vulnerabilities in the teleport, I should be talking about it. And it's a confessional moment. This is, a, this is a first for the show. <laughs> but I was getting what. nervous when he said he was auditing what I was doing on the servers. <laughs> so um, when we started, we had a choice to make. Which SSH foundation we want to build teleport on top of? You obviously don't want in this day and age to be re-implementing crypto from scratch. That would be just a suicide. And I would never, ever advise anyone to use a product uh, that was built this way. And you really only have, I would say, three options if you want a solid uh, SSH, uh, uh, crypto, crypto suitable for SSH. Uh, you could build actually on top of OpenSSH. That's actually um, a decent, uh, or OpenSSL, uh, it, it's a decent option, and it's uh, proven by uh, being in production for a long time. But we really got attracted by Google's implementation of SSH that, is, that comes with Go. And even though it was new, and it wasn't uh, wildly uh, used at the time. So that's what we've adopted. And I think over time, it's proven to be the right choice. Because if you look at just the disclosed vulnerabilities that existed uh, elsewhere, uh, Google's implementation um, it's proven to be quite solid. So we did not really have to react to that many CVEs. I would even say that the, our biggest uh, CVE, like source of CVEs that we had to respond to came from just Go standard library. Because Teleport is written in Go and Go had like a, a couple of security related issues with it. But if you, um, just going back to your question, I want to answer it directly because I like direct responses to simple questions. What are the biggest source of potential vulnerabilities? I would say it's, it's the web component. So Teleport, if you just uh, look at it as a standard implementation of SSH, which works via like command line, it's been rock solid and we didn't really have to react to that many CVs, as I said. Uh, but fortunately slash unfortunately, Teleport also has a web user interface. The idea there is that if for whatever reason you need, some, you need to get something done and you don't have a CLI environment in front of you, maybe using old version of Windows, you could just type the name of your SSH proxy in a browser and you will go through same SSO process with second factor and everything and you will get a web-based CLI client which you could use to SSH into any node that you have access to. And it's been incredibly popular. So one reason it's popular is because of Windows Another one is because you could use it on actually any device, like an iPad or your phone. So being able to access your servers via SSH using a browser is obviously convenient for lots and lots of people. But that very same web interface is also used to actually examine audit information to configure your role-based um, access control. Um, basically, most of teleport administration happens there. And uh, surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, so that is basically the biggest source of potential vulnerabilities that we had to watch closely. And we've seen uh, CVEs, uh, I think it was from Go's runtime around the HTTPS, um, just uh, like the web framework that we had to fix. And we also ourselves like made a few um, not, not critical mistakes that we caught in time because we periodically re uh, hire professional um, uh, security companies to come and audit Teleport for us. So we do it frequently, multiple times a year. Uh, and that has been historically kind of the most dangerous area of technology to secure. Well, thank you very much for the, the honest and thorough answer. We really appreciate it. Look, it's, it's rock solid. No one uh, has ever been hacked through Teleport. So, but I'm just, uh, as a technologist, um, I think it's, it's, it's not a secret that the web stack is so uh, vast and complex that most of these um, like issues, that's where they uh, can be hidden. Well, I liked what you said earlier about uh, keeping things simple and not adding features just to add features. It's definitely an enterprise-y 
um, pattern, anti-pattern, right? Just like, oh, we need something for the next quarterly release. So what feature are you going to add? We're going to add some a huge amount of bugs, okay, so that we'll have <laughs> something to fix in the next quarter. Yeah, I mean, we can beat up on enterprise all the all we want, but uh, they, they need all these different good products as well. But I, I like what you've been saying about trying to go after, you know, the more fortune uh, – 1 million or the smaller companies so that they can actually have something that makes them more secure out of the box is, is teleport used. So it makes me think about businesses and how businesses can use it and, and, and benefit from this, which leads me to, I guess, kind of what the question is like, do you guys help with being able to pass like um, audits for uh, PCI and, and compliances is what I'm looking for. Uh, what, well, did you have any good uh, white papers or, or case studies about that? So the short answer is yes, of course. And uh, you could basically, you could probably use Google search to Google things like teleport HIPAA compliance, teleport PCI compliance. Um, and um, I would actually make a comment that teleport is quite widely adopted at large uh, companies as well. Because when I was uh, talking about small businesses, what I meant by that is like no one, like quite frequently people just cannot afford to have a giant team. But that is also true for a large company if you zoom in into one particular practice. Like no one some like no one can afford to have like a, a professional uh, infrastructure security person for every single project within a larger company, for example. So we have customers like NASDAQ and IBM and uh, Samsung, they uh, use Teleport and they, it's kind of growing in usage internally. Simply because these companies, they experience talent shortage as well. Everyone does. That's ultimately what I think good uh, tools and solutions are all about. It's about doing more with a smaller team. Um, but uh, speaking of compliance, like for an engineer who's never dealt with compliance, I'd like to uh, compare compliance to those checklists. So if you read about uh, aviation, how pilots... Like everything you do in an airplane as a pilot, it's like checklist driven. Like before you take off, you have to go through like, yes, 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 yes. Before you land, you have to do that same thing. Or if one of your engines fails, you the first thing you have to go through checklist. So that's really what these compliance standards are. And if you use a system like Teleport in production, it simply allows you to quickly answer to some of these questions. Um, I, I definitely say it would be exaggeration to say, hey, if you use Teleport, you automatically become PCI compliant because, come on, your own application needs to be done properly. But it definitely makes it much, much easier to go th through most of these compliance you know, checklists if you have a system like Teleport in place because it gives you simple answers to a lot of these questions. Early in my career, I figured out which jobs were worth working at and which ones weren't, mostly by trial and error. I created a system that I used to find jobs and later contracts as a freelancer. If you're looking for a job or trying to figure out where you should go next, then check out my book, The Max Coder's Guide to Finding Your Dream Developer Job. The book walks you through figuring out what you want, vetting companies that meet your criteria, meeting that company's employees, and getting them to recommend you for a job. Don't settle for whoever has listed their job on the job board. Go out and proactively find the job you'll love. Buy the book at devchat.tv slash job book. That's devchat.tv slash job book. Cool. And I mean, are the, does the web UI have good reports for that kind of stuff to help aid in that or? No. We, um, so what you're referring to, it's, uh, it's maybe, it's, it's a deeper uh, assistance with implementing compliance when you mm. basically generate the thematic documentation. No, Teleport simply says that, um, for example, some of these compliance standards, they say like, well, do you terminate connections automatically after 15 minutes? And in Teleport, it's all done properly by default. So every Teleport setting that we have, uh, it was picked intelligently because we looked at FedRAMP, for example. What does FedRAMP require for you to, uh, to be able to say yes to some of these questions? And uh, simply by using Teleport, you can just confidently say yes, yes, yes. Do you have like encryption addressed for your SSH secrets? Like yes, because Teleport, um, because with Teleport, if you point at DynamoDB, DynamoDB itself is compliance so you could say yes and just move on because all of your SSH secrets they all come down to this one off server setting where the CA goes and if CA goes into this one place then it means that across all of your data centers all of your smart devices all of your laptops that employees are using you don't have a single SSH secret anywhere so mm -hmm. that's really why it makes it so easy and um, 
painless to go through this kind of infrastructure compliance procedures. Bless you for taking some of the pain out of audits because they are horrible. Well, well so. I'll, take, uh, I'll take it and I'll say thank you, but it's not me personally who did it. Obviously, the team, so we have uh, yeah. quite talented people there who, uh, who enjoy solving it uh, for the community in the open. Yes, like, keep in mind too, like you don't have to like come to us and pay us money to do all of that. Teleport, like everything I've been talking about is available in open source version. So anyone can just go download and get themselves uh, industry best practices uh, uh, for SSH and Kubernetes access. Yeah, and I added to our show notes here, uh, a link to just as you were mentioning the FedRAMP and that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, we'll get more into some show notes and picks in just a little bit, I think. But, uh, but yeah, I added a link to that, and it looks like your documentation site has a lot of great reference material to to get up to speed on on what Teleport can do and and how to set it up. So, I always appreciate good, appreciate good documentation. Uh, yeah, it's actually uh, it's surprisingly it's a lot of work. Uh, I can, I can <laughs> quite frequently, and maybe it's just because I'm an engineer it's easier to build something sometimes than to document it. So one more question uh, before we move on to picks. Uh, where do you see gravitational going in the next, let's say two years? Five two years, years is a long time for a startup, but let's say two years. Uh, I was about to give you or three. a five-year answer. because okay, Or if you've, got a, if you've got a five-year answer, we'll, we'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> um, look, gravitational was built because of this frustration that we had as founders. Uh, having to do DevOps, actually. Like, we had a company that we started in 2009 or 10, uh, Mailgun, uh, email delivery service, that uh, was acquired by Rackspace a while ago. And uh, Rackspace, the first thing they told us after the acquisition, they said, look, you have to move Mailgun to Rackspace, which kind of makes sense. Why would Rackspace have uh, a service that runs on IBM servers? And we used to have... IBM account, which was software at the time. So we started this migration project and it took us like a, like a few months, let's say six months, I don't remember exactly. And I remember thinking, that is crazy. Like we moving our code from one group of servers to another group of servers. That code is less than one megabyte. So why, like, why, what happened to our industry that we made a simple task of copying a few hundred files? <laughs> <laughs> to convert that into a multi-month project. Like, because back before internet, before uh, cloud computing, if you had a piece of software and I wanted it, you could just give it to me, right? You could put it on a DVD or whatever, like floppy drive, or, or you could put it on your website and just download it. So we used to trade software freely. But when it comes to cloud software, why is it so super glued to one specific location and you cannot move it anywhere? And then, and why do you need to have a massive DevOps team to constantly run it? It just feels bad, like we're moving backwards in time. So the, 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 today's software business, my like cloud software business, reminds me of these old computers from the 50s, like when you read history books and they tell you that you used to buy these computers and you have to walk around and you have to kick bugs and cockroaches, all of these machines because they're causing short circuits and you need to be replacing relays and vacuum pipe, uh, vacuum tubes continuously. And that's just how modern SaaS environment feels like to me. Like we're all engaged into this like business of, we're basically catering to hardware. That's what it is. Yeah, sure, it's sitting in someone's account uh, in the Amazon server, but that's what we DevOps people do. We cater to hardware, which is backwards. I think machines should instead do what we tell them. And that's what Gravitational was formed. We basically want software, cloud software, any kind of software, to be able to run anywhere in the world without human supervision. Can we get it done in five years? I think we'll get close. And uh, Teleport was born because we realized that before we get to execute on this idea of running software autonomously anywhere, we need to first connect everywhere. Everything everywhere needs to be connected securely. And because today everyone is using SSH and now we're getting things like Kubernetes in, into the mix, you have to get that solved first. And that's the name Teleport because if you, if you're Netflix or if you're Tesla, like you have smart devices like smart TVs in, and they are running your code, 
Like your TV is running like code written by Netflix engineers. Or you have these self-driving trucks somewhere and they also run code. And then you have servers in Amazon and you maybe have servers in your own data center. All of that is your platform. All of that is just a giant distributed computer. So how do you get access to all of this completely seamlessly? So that's what Teleport solves. And the second product that we're also working on called Gravity. So that, that's the next step further is like, how do you make software run everywhere automatically? Uh, how do you make zero, like, how do you build software without having a slightest idea of like where it will run? Because today with people building applications, it's almost like they're building the sandwich where, oh, this is my first layer, that's my Amazon server. Then I'm gonna put something on top, maybe like a Kubernetes or something, then another layer, another layer, and then five years later, you don't even remember how it was built. So if you talk to most companies in Silicon Valley and ask them, can you recreate your entire AWS production environment in a different Amazon account? A lot of them will just not even know how to begin. I just, it feels temporary to me. Come on, how can we tolerate this for long? And uh, fortunate enough being an entrepreneur, that's my only answer. It's like, hey, let's start a company. Let's try to get something uh, done. Um, simply because it just feels incredibly uh, primitive that, that we catering to hardware this way, uh, the way we do. Not sure if I'm answering your question. Oh, no, but, that, uh, that answers it but all right. That's where we're going. Like, I want to get as much as possible done on that front in two years, in five years, in 10, until I die. That's basically my focus is to go back to these times when software could be freely movable and it did not require massive amounts of team of people standing around and massaging it continuously to just keep breathing, keep breathing. That's just uh, temporary. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate you coming on. I had learned a lot this episode. I think all of us did, and I think our listeners will too. Now, at the end of every show, we t uh, always pick out uh, each of us one or two picks, things we found useful to us in the past week, uh, technical or non-technical, either is fine. Uh, I will go ahead and get started. And my first one is a blog post. So as some of you know, I'm on the board of an organization called Operation Code, where we work with military veterans and their families who are transitioning into civilian life, helping them learn software skills and uh, move into those high paying technical jobs. So we decided years ago that we were going to run our site on Kubernetes. Is that overkill for a nonprofit site? Yes, it is. But the reason we did that was we wanted it to be a teaching tool for the technologies that were number one, the most in demand and number two could uh, you bring someone the highest salary. So we ran into a little bit of trouble with our AWS bill recently, uh, where it was, it was, it was too big a percentage of our monthly uh, donation amount, let's say, that, that it was taking up. So one of our volunteers, Irving Papo, Popovetsky, I think I said his last name right, I worked with our team to refactor it. And in refactoring it, we shaved off two thirds of our AWS bill and our Kubernetes infrastructure is in a much, much better place than it was beforehand. So he wrote up how he did it, uh, how the team did it in a blog post. And I recommend everyone give that a read. I will put that link in the show notes. My second pick is, I can't, I don't think I can say this is non-technical, but it's a game, uh, Animal Crossing New Horizons. So I had not personally played an Animal Crossing game before, but I'd heard a lot about it, so I wasn't sure what to expect when I downloaded it. This is the perfect game for our times because it is incredibly, you know, it's one of those games where you play a little bit every day, you make a little bit of progress on different goals, you're gathering things, you're fishing, etc. It's so soothing to do that at the end of each day or throughout the day. <laughs> and in an anxious time, I, th I think this is the game we need right now. So uh, if you've got a Nintendo Switch, highly recommend it. And with that, let's go to Tyler. Well, and I'd like to dovetail off of that because my se I, uh, second which I'll now do first pick was going to be uh, this website called Deku Deals. Um, and Deku Deals essentially is a website that helps you find deals on Nintendo Switch. So most uh, you know, AAA games like uh, Animal Crossing that just came out aren't gonna go on sale for, uh, you know, while they're so popular. But every once in a while, you can basically set a watch on a, on a game you're interested in and, and get it for less and, and see how the market's been playing with it. It gives you a bunch of analytics data on, on each game. And 
for somebody who's a little too um, collecty and buys too many games, it helps me stay collecty, but also stay within a better budget. So, so I really enjoy that. Uh, so people could watch that if they if they want to save a couple bucks on Animal Crossing in maybe a month or two. Uh, but for now, you're probably going to have to spend the full amount because it is very popular. Um, my other pick is one that I would like to mention. It's a ruby gem, uh, and it's called Working Man. And it was created by a former colleague uh, about a dozen years ago who just wanted to save some of uh, his Mac OS uh, configuration. And so what it allows you to do is uh, save a thing so that you can open up your uh, terminal and then type in working man start. And what it'll do is it'll reopen all of your uh, apps. So let's say you turn your computer off at night and you want to get started where you were last time. Um, you can essentially save the configuration of, of what you're doing. Now, I'm trying to stress test it and, and do it with eight different desktops on my Mac and using multiple files and seeing if I can really put it to, this, to the test at this point because I'm using different lanes and different colors to kind of uh, keep things in, uh, in my head a little bit split up and, and so I can more effectively and efficiently multitask at work. And if I uh, make a good headway on that. I'll, I'll post a blog post about that and, and share it with the, the team. But uh, yeah, I really, it, this gem has always been, it's one of those things that's kind of bulletproof because it is fairly basic. It only works on Mac, but uh, you know, and, and it's, it's only if you have Ruby, but people who, who have a Mac usually have Ruby and, and it's pretty simple to, to configure if you're, if you're in that demographic. So that's what I'd recommend. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Chuck, mm -hmm. how about you? Yeah, um, I've got a couple of picks. Uh, the first one is a book that I've been listening to on Audible. Um, it's not a technical book. It is The Cash Flow Quadrant by Robert Kiyosaki. Um, he's the guy who wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And yes, I've heard some people complain about him and the way that he conducts business. But the stuff in the book is pretty spot on from what I can tell. So I'm really enjoying that. And it's making me think about where I'm headed with the stuff that I'm working on. I'm also going to throw out the devchat.tv slash meetups and that's the online meetups. If you're stuck at home and you know, anyway, uh, we, like I said, JavaScript, React, Vue, Angular, and Ray, Ruby. RailsConf got canceled. So I'm looking to put on a remote conference for that. Um, I'm putting on a JavaScript conference in May. Um, a lot of the speakers are already listed. By the time this goes live, you'll probably be able to see the full lineup of speakers. Um, iOS, React Native are the next ones that I'm putting together. And then, yeah, I'm probably going to either do DevOps or DevSecOps. I haven't decided which one I want. If you have DevOps heroes that you want me to invite to speak, just tweet them at me at CMaxW on Twitter. It's probably the easiest way to do it. And then I will go. I, I'm pretty good at tracking people down on the internet. I am the consummate internet stalker. So I, I should be able to find them. And then, um, you know, and then they can tell me no. And then I'll probably leave them alone and not stalk them anymore. But um, at least that way, yeah. Um, probably. I, I'm pretty persistent. Anyway, so yeah, at the end of the day, um, I would love help just knowing who you want to hear from. Um, so yeah, so those are, those are my picks. Um, devchat.tv meetups, devchat.tv slash conferences, and uh, that book by Robert Kiyosaki. All right. Thank you. Ev, how about you? So I'm not sure if it uh, qualifies uh, as a pick, but um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I went to a photo store here in Berkeley and I um, uh, to uh, pick a lens for my digital camera and I got to talk to a saleswoman there and she said that young people these days, they're all switching to film photography. And I was uh, shocked by that. I was like, no way. And he, it's like, she actually showed me numbers that supposedly like film sales are doubling. Like either is it year over year? I'm not sure. But so I ended up buying film camera and some black and white film. And then I said, you know what? Let's go all the way and uh, got my some, like got myself some chemicals to process film at home. And I just uh, developed the first few rolls and I highly recommend it. So that was, uh, <laughs> it, makes, uh, it makes this process of making a picture much more involved. And you get a lot of positive emotions. It's almost like woodworking, like making things with your own hands. So if you are getting bored with your iPhone picture-taking capabilities, 
um, go to eBay, buy yourself uh, like a 25-year-old Nikon camera and uh, make some photos with your own hands. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you once again for coming on our show. Uh, good to uh, talk with all of you. And listeners, we will be back in your ears next week. Take care, everyone. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.